Hello, and welcome to a series of short videos that will hopefully help all of us make better sense of our material world and many of the environmentally related challenges we're now facing. This and the following 14 videos have been developed from the work of a group of 28 students in Technology Society Environment Studies, and they wanted to create this series to help us to gain a perspective on how we can live a little more healthily on our wonderful little planet. The plan for the series is to work from the large issues through to the smaller yet critical issues we make choices about every day, and then to work back again to see how those everyday choices form part of the larger context, hence the title, The Layers of the Onion. Now, the first question is probably, why are we doing this at all? And the answer is simply that over the past 50 years or so, we've started to realize that we're living on a finite planet far away from any hospitable planet similar to our own. Perhaps it was seeing the Earth from space in the late 1960s or the oil crisis in the 1970s, but somewhere around the late 60s or 70s, the seeds of environmental consequences were first sown. And we started to realize we can't go on treating the planet as if it were a business that had gone bankrupt. And we're simply disposing of the assets. Now, there are many real concerns. The population of the planet is over 7 billion. We're concerned that we've passed the point of peak oil. We're concerned about pollution and contamination, while our economic system drives us to do more and more and to be more competitive, to raise our GDP, to fuel our economy, and of course, we all want to survive. We also want to live a better life in the process. So, how we change the habits of our exploitive evolution is proving difficult. And some think that perhaps we've already gone too far. But every day, we all have to get up and face the world, earn a living, feed ourselves and our families, and hopefully enjoy ourselves along the way. So these videos are intended to help us to continue to do just that. Now, how are we doing? A lot's changed in recent years. There's a great deal of research going on in energy and resource use, in technology, environmental science and policy, for example. And we're now developing codes of practice and standards and around the world, companies and countries are trying to do more and more with less. Interestingly, our successes can often be seen to be proceeding from the back to the front. As we realize that the consequences of pollution and toxic waste can no longer be treated like a drop in the ocean. So we freely use the word recycle as if it were a panacea. We've got blue boxes and black boxes and green boxes. But to a large extent, we're dealing with a symptom. The question remains, why do we need so much stuff in the first place? So, if we're going to make better choices, we need perspective. We're going to learn how to do healthy things in healthy ways. So we need to arm ourselves as simply as possible with the knowledge that will help us put the layers of the problems into an understandable whole. So back to the onion and that fairly obvious metaphor. How do we begin? So first, we're going to look at our precious planet and the solar system it's part of. Now, our little planet lies in what's known as the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold. An area of the solar system where planet-sized objects can exist that may have air pressure and liquid water. And to date, we're the only such planet that we know very much about. So, if we scaled the solar system down by a factor of a billion, the Earth would shrink to the size of a grape. The Moon would be about uh, 40 centimeters away, and it would be the size of a grain of rice. The sun would be about 1.5 meters in diameter, and it would be two or three blocks away. And a human being would be the size of an atom. And the nearest star would still be 40,000 kilometers away. Mars is our closest planet, and when our orbits are favorable, it's 54.6 million kilometers away. Mars doesn't have liquid water because it's too far away from the sun, unless it's too cold. Venus, which is closer to the sun than, than we are, it gets twice the sunlight and the heat, and it's extremely uninhabitable. In short, the potential for us to relocate or even survive on either planet is virtually non-existent and especially since it costs about $10,000 in fuel alone to get a litre of water up to the space station, and that's only four hours away. We're not going anywhere soon. So we're very lucky that we have the sun, just where it is, to support the life that has evolved here on Earth, and the vital balance that helps us survive. 
and that's proving to be far more sensitive than we previously realized. Every object in space, regardless of mass, size and distance, exerts a gravitational pull on the Earth and the objects around it. Now, this pull ensures that all planets rotate in perfect synchronization, and so to revolve precisely around our main source of light, energy and life, our amazing Sun. The Sun's complex reactions turn hydrogen into helium, releasing light and heat. It's a nuclear power source which can provide up to 1,368 watts per square meter at noon at the equator. To put that in perspective, NASA suggests that we would need as much as 1.7 billion large power plants to generate the same amount of energy. So not only is the Earth located at a perfect distance from the Sun, the Earth's atmosphere and the magnetic field both warm and protect us. You see, one of the most delicate and important features of our planet is that part we don't see so much in photographs, the atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere, as the layers of gases surrounding us, allow for life as we know it. The gases are attracted to the Earth by gravity and have acted for many, many years as a natural greenhouse, making the planet about 33 degrees centigrade warmer than it would be without them. So our average temperature is about 14.5 degrees centigrade rather than minus 18 degrees centigrade. It also helps support organisms such as us humans that, that breathe oxygen and supplies carbon dioxide to plants and, and protects us from harmful UV rays. Now the first layer of the atmosphere above the Earth's surface is called the troposphere. It exists from the surface to about 8 to 20 kilometers and contains about 85 to 90 percent of the atmospheric gases which makes it extremely significant for life. It's also where all the weather occurs. The higher we get in the troposphere, the colder it gets, down to about minus 80 degrees centigrade. Second layer of the atmosphere is the, the stratosphere, as high as 50 kilometers, which contains the ozone layer, that which stops most of the UV radiation from making it to the Earth's surfaces, thus protecting us from those harmful rays, which we hear about through skin cancer, etc when the uh, ozone is diminished. Now, the higher we get in, the, in, in this layer, the warmer it gets. The next two layers are the mesosphere, that's up to 75 kilometers, and the thermosphere up to 450 kilometers. And the gases in these two layers are quite sparse. Now, the overall composition of the atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen gas, 21% oxygen gas, and 0.9% argon with about 0.04% carbon dioxide by volume. And this is where we start to understand this issue we call climate change. The International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is a group of scientists who've managed to convince many of the skeptics that climate change is real. And even the most subtle of changes can make a large difference. The atmosphere of our planet was quite stable for most of the last 10,000 years and then came the Industrial Revolution. And about 150 years ago, the atmosphere started to change. And most of it can be easily related to human activities, such as the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation. These activities have led to an increase in gases such as methane, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide, which while naturally occurring, are being added to the atmosphere as a consequence of human activity at a rate that cannot be naturally cycled out before more are added. The effect is cumulative. So these greenhouse gases are closely linked to the almost one degree centigrade increase in the average global temperature from 1961 to today. It's just one degree. But the effect is potentially disastrous. This one degree rise can change weather patterns and help create extremes of climate variation. But is the damage to the atmospheric stability that is the biggest threat. Through melting ice, we've got sea levels that have risen about 17 centimeters since 1961. And we've lost about 2 million square kilometers of snow cover in the same period. That's about 6% of it. And the result is that while we've previously been naturally able to reflect about a third of the energy and light that comes to the surface of the Earth back to outer space, we now have detrimentally affected the atmospheric chemistry that's protected us for so long. There are two main causes. One is the reduction in the albedo, 
That's the important reflection of energy away from the Earth due to ice and snow, and the absorption of energy thanks to our forests. The second is related to the atmospheric gases themselves. Thanks to the increase in carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and H2O, we're now reflecting about 1.6 watts per square meter less energy and light than we used to. That's only a third of 1% change, but the results are very significant. And that one degree is growing. So the good news is that we've been able to make something of a difference in the past. We've taken steps over a, a number of years in some parts of the world to, to reduce the use of our coal. The CFC problems of the 1980s and 90s that caused holes in the ozone layer have been somewhat reversed thanks to concerted efforts following the Montreal Protocol. Unfortunately, it's going to take about 100 years to readjust from the CFC levels now in our atmosphere that helped give us refrigeration for the past 80 years. We've also been able to make a positive difference in response to concerns for acid rain. So there's hope. Our current atmospheric changes are the result of a range of human activities. They range from transportation, deforestation, desertification, agriculture, industry, all our residential and commercial activities. But interestingly, the largest amount now comes from the process of creating our energy supply in the first place. But remember, We've made a positive difference in the past, and there is no reason to believe that we can't make a positive difference in the future. So, to sum up, we aren't physically going anywhere soon, and there's no magical solutions, just a need for good sense. So, how we undertake our human activities into the future will take some thought. And the next video, it's all about energy in all its guises. So, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.